Good morning, everyone. My name is Ashvin from the class of 2025, and I'm a philosophy, politics, and economics major minoring in arts and humanities. I'll be your MC for today. I would now like to invite Dr. Trisha Craig, Senior Lecturer of Social Sciences and Vice President of Engagement at Yale NUS College to introduce the first panel of the symposium. Panel one, liberal arts education in a time of geopolitical risk. Dr. Craig, please. Thanks, Ash. Uh, good morning and welcome to our first panel. I am very excited to hear our two speakers who come from two incredible liberal arts institutions that are working under evolving and somewhat trying circumstances. Each of our speakers will talk for about 20 minutes and then after that we will open the conversation uh, to you, our, uh, our audience here, in, here in, the, um, in the performance hall. So let me first introduce our speakers um, and then we'll get started. Dr. Shalini Renderia became president and rector of the Central European University in Vienna in 2021. She has a distinguished academic career as a social anthropologist, publishing on globalization, law, the state, social movements with a particular focus on India. In Europe, she's held leadership positions at institutions across the continent, the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and she holds the Excellence Chair at the University of Bremen in Germany. There, she leads a research cluster on soft authoritarianisms. Professor Renderia is also the host of an influential podcast, which I will recommend to you. Uh, it's called Democracy in Question. Our second speaker, Dr. Jha Motan, is the president and founding uh, founding uh, leader of Parami University in Myanmar. He is the product of a liberal arts education. He did his undergraduate degree at Bard College at Simons Rock and Oxford University, and he holds a PhD from Yale in chemistry. Dr. Jaw's belief in the transformative power of the liberal arts led him in 2017 to start the Parami Institute to provide liberal education to college graduates in Myanmar, hoping that they would take a leadership role in the development of the country. He built the foundations for Parami University, a residential degree granting university, um, but in 2021, the coup in Myanmar meant a pivot for that institution, and we'll hear more from him about um, the process of that in his remarks. So, without further ado, let me invite our first speaker to the stage, President Shalini Renderia. Please. Good morning, and thank you very much, Trisha, for this generous uh, introduction. In one way, my talk today couldn't be a greater contrast to Dr. Grant's really positive, enthusiastic talk, which we heard yesterday. This is going to be a rather gloomy discussion, I'm afraid. Uh, but the world is gloomy if you look at it from the point of view of the principles of academic freedom, which is what I'm going to address uh, from a very particular point of view, and that is, I would like to share with you some of our experiences of a small private research university that is a Central European University. We have about 1,500 students um, from over 100 countries. It was set up as a regional university, not a national institution, which is one of the productive tensions, as uh, President Roberts mentioned, which I'll talk about a little. And 80% of our students receive financial aid. So it's a private university, not only not for profit, but one which gives scholarships to almost uh, more than three quarters of its students. Until recently, we were an exclusively graduate institution. We were set up actually, for those of you who don't know the history, in Prague and had to leave Czechoslovakia for political reasons very soon after our founding. We then moved to Budapest and we have been asked by the Hungarian government through the laws that it passed, and I'll be saying something about that in a moment, to um, stop teaching our 
American accredited degree programs. So we were duly accredited in Budapest, both Hungarian and American degrees. And the Hungarian degrees can be continued in Budapest. It's the American degrees which are a problem. And we'll see in a moment why. We then turned ourselves into also an undergraduate degree-giving institution in Vienna because Austrian university accreditation requires that every uh, university has two undergraduate programs. So the college, which was purposefully modeled on the US liberal arts style, was launched only four years ago after our forced move as a result of the law passed by the Hungarian government, commonly known as Lex CEU. So I won't limit my remarks to liberal arts education in the narrow sense of undergraduate studies with small uh, classes uh, imparting critical and a broad humanities social science education because in our case it's also mixed with departments of cognitive science, network and data sciences. All our three undergraduate degrees are interdisciplinary programs. They're all dual degrees, US and Austrian accredited. Uh, and I can talk about them uh, later if um, you would uh, like in the Q&A. So allow me to reflect more broadly instead on the threats facing any level of university education in the humanistic social sciences and situated in the broader zeitgeist which is characterized unfortunately by attacks on liberal democracy which in my view is a crucial societal and institutional precondition of liberal arts education. Liberal democracy is vitally dependent on a thriving, intellectually vibrant and critical university milieu. Today, universities are under attack from what I have called soft authoritarian regimes. These are not military dictatorships of the 60s and 70s, so often they go unnoticed because they are electoral democracies. These are right-wing populist elected governments which are systematically hollowing out across Europe, but also in the rest of the world, liberal principles and values using the law and constitutional courts to undermine the rule of law. And I think this is a very, very important characteristic which we need to remember because what looks like an exercise in law is actually an exercise in subverting liberal values and hollowing them out from within. And that's something which I'll show you in the Hungarian case in a moment. It's important in this context to recognize the mutually interdependent relationship between liberal democracy and higher education. Ron Daniels' book, um, What Universities Owe Democracy, argues, and I think he's absolutely right about this, that it's not merely an issue of institutional survival for universities in the face of authoritarian threats, but it's also a matter of active, proactive intervention by universities for democracy. That is, universities ought to abandon the rather self-limiting ideals of hyper-professionalized scholasticism. Instead, they should embrace openly, as he argues, the democratic values that they themselves not only epitomize, but depend on and also shape and constitute. If liberal arts colleges and universities are indispensable for keeping the spirit of democracy alive, they cannot be indifferent, nor can they be passive in the face of the dismantling of democracy from within, which ends up curtailing academic freedom in various ways. What and how and whom we teach, what we can research, how universities are governed, how much autonomy they may have, what role they play in the public sphere, what educational aims universities pursue have all become matters that are increasingly coming under scrutiny and also intervention by these kinds of soft authoritarian regimes. It's only within this broader context of the existential crisis of universities in general and academic freedom in particular that we can understand the challenges which are facing liberal arts education in an age of geopolitical risks. Incidentally, it might be more useful in my view to talk about geopolitical uncertainties rather than risk. So I want to make the very quickly the very well-known distinction that Frank Wright makes. Risk is predictable, uncertainty is not. So I'm going to talk very much about geopolitical uncertainties. Attacks on academic freedom, the foundational principle of universities, predates many of the geopolitical uncertainties that concern us today. Academic freedom is not only a relatively recent achievement, it's always been open to challenge, both from within and without. 
In many countries, state-funded institutions of higher education can become venues of dogmatic indoctrination. We've seen that recently in Hungary. I can say more about that. Um, we can also uh, look at the US um, experience uh, here in this regard about curricular changes, about textbooks which have been banned. Uh, Poland uh, has banned my discipline, anthropology. It's been turned into a part of religious studies in Poland. Hungary, you are not allowed to teach gender studies in public universities. So the kinds of intervention into universities uh, has been really enormous. The turning of Hungarian public universities into private foundations is the latest in um, this kind of playbook of soft authoritarian control over universities. This is where the Orban government has put in lifelong trustees belonging to the ruling party to run these um, uh, foundations. Um, and this endangers the vestiges of academic freedom constantly subjected to threats of censorship, political interference in appointments, in curricula, and we have seen cases of persecution and imprisonment of academics and students in Turkey under Erdogan. Uh, so we have a whole spectrum from not very apparent interventions to really obvious political repression, as in Turkey. The latest report on academic, the Academic Freedom Index, prepared by Katrin Kinzelbach and her colleagues in Germany, points out that in 177 countries, and I quote it, in the 177 countries surveyed, there has been a substantially and statistically significant decline in academic freedom in 19 cases. 37% of the world's population, however, lives in those 19 countries. Second, the decline in academic freedom accompanies an accelerating and deepening wave of autocratization. All world regions except sub-Saharan Africa show substantial declines in academic freedom. Latin America returns to a situation last recorded in 1987, while Eastern and Central Europe has fallen, and Central Asia has fallen to a record low since the fall of the Iron Curtain. The decline in academic freedom also appears to have accelerated in Western Europe and North America, which have long been bastions of academic freedom and scientific excellence." Unquote. While many ultra-conservatives routinely lament the woke hegemony of cancel culture on American campuses, the powerful interests behind such conservative political forces have attempted to push back and stifle voices of critical dissent by not only, as I said, banning books, but even questioning the legitimacy of entire disciplines. So the two that I think in Europe, which have been interesting apart from the Eastern Europe, I want to talk a little bit about Western Europe as well, the diatribes by leading French and German politicians against post-colonial theory, against critical race theory, have been noticeable for those of us who have been scrutinizing these very, very vocal but not so obvious changes in the climate around French universities and also the discussion in, around German universities. Nothing illustrates better the negative feedback loop between challenges to academic freedom and the systematic dismantling of liberal democracy in Europe than the forced relocation of my own university, the CEU driven out of Budapest by the whims of the Orban regime. And let me say just very quickly a few things about it because there are certain not very well noticed facts about uh, the uh, Lex CEU story, which I think are a cautionary tale for all of us. Hungary has been a member state of the European Union for two decades, but in an unprecedented move, following a playbook which many of the soft authoritarian regimes all over the world are following, the Orban government passed a legislation overnight. So it took three hours of discussion in the parliament in 2017 with the thinly disguised aim of de facto shutting down our university. We became the first ever institution of higher education to be forcibly relocated in the history of the European Union, showing how vulnerable academic freedom is and how much it depends on other non-academic forms of reason and reasoning in Europe. Of course, 
the university took this decision to the Hungarian Constitutional Court. We lost our case. We then took it to the European Court of Justice. And four years later, in October 2020, the ruling of the European Court of Justice against the Hungarian government was in favor of the university. The ruling came too late, by which time, due to the uncertainties, the university had already moved to Vienna. However, what's important to note is that the European Court of Justice ruled against the so-called Lex CEU primarily based on the Hungarian government's violation of the rules of the WTO, of the World Trade Organization, and in particular, the General Agreement on Trade and Services and the Freedom to Establish and Move Services. So even when the judgment mentioned academic freedom, it was in the concept of relating it to the freedom to conduct business. There are two important lessons, I think, which we can draw from this. First, we need to pay much greater attention to the fundamental conditions of possibility for exercising and guaranteeing academic freedom. These conditions are institutionally impure, shot through with competing rationalities, not just of politics, but also thus of the market, because it's under the gaps, the general agreement on tariffs and trades that the ECJ defended academic freedom. So the absolute and sacrosanct freedom of the market and of enterprise may have been invoked in the ruling in, the case, in this case, but in these days of the marketization of universities, this represents a much greater cause for concern as much as politically motivated attacks. Threats to university autonomy and academic freedom thus also include more subtle mechanisms of dependence and interference, subordinations to the dictates of markets and the logic of finance to so the narrow utilitarian calculus of profitability, returns of investment, which has led, for example, to the closure of many departments in British public universities, and which can often imperceptibly also influence intellectual agendas. The effect of this transformation is that students are increasingly then seen as individual consumers, encouraged to focus on the instrumental value of education, and that's something, as we heard in Dr. Grant's talk yesterday, is where is it that students' trajectories from some of these universities lead them to? And if universities become, or university education becomes primarily a means to employability, higher salaries, I think we have come, fallen short of what our values should be. So universities then face pressure to provide consumer satisfaction rather than broader intellectual horizons and critical moral development. In short, we need to recognize and problematize the currently prevailing philosophies of successful higher education models, which are unwittingly being reshaped and are also replicating the rationality and logics of neoliberal capitalism in many, many places. The second lesson that I would like to turn to is more directly related to geopolitical risks, or as I said, uncertainties. Let me go back to my example of the CEU and its relocation to Austria. Illiberal leaders such as Orban have proved remarkably adept at exploiting the inherent weaknesses of democratic and legal constitutional structures and the principle that they evoke when they come up with legislation such as LexEU is national sovereignty. And that is what we are running up against when, you are, when parliament's national law is being used as an instrument against uh, academic freedom. And of course, leaders like Orban, uh, but also Erdogan can mar marshal impressive resources to try to outplay small independent universities like ours within the regional marketplace of learning and knowledge production. The Orban regime has set up a lavishly endowed network of elite colleges like the Matthias Corvinius Collegium, MCC, which besides supporting talented Hungarian students, many of whom are groomed to become cadres in the regime's sprawling apparatus, and it really is um, the ideological face of the regime producing, as he says, a counter elite, a conservative political elite. Is, these are the uh, institutions which are branching out abroad 
with the declared aim of transforming the intellectual and political landscape in Europe. So um, the MCC has bought a private university in Vienna last year, is also linked with a collegium intermarium in Poland, which is a very, very extreme right-wing Polish institution, and you're getting a network across Europe which should be cause for concern. Interestingly, these are, and Orban is a good right-wing follower of Gramsci here. It's a regime which knows all too well that in a protracted war of position, the shaping of cultural ideological hegemony is of paramount importance. Orban's tactical acumen, that is his gambit to oust CU from Budapest, it was in the first year of, pres of Trump presidency, which in some way marked, I think, the beginning of today's geopolitical uncertainties. It represents the return of a peculiar sort of hard power to center stage in European politics, which the EU has been very slow to recognize, let alone successfully, op uh, successfully oppose as long as the EU has relied on moral persuasion, soft law, partial economic sanctions. Paradoxically, now that the EU has finally launched its rule of law mechanism against the Hungarian and also the Polish government, and is withholding the disbursement of some of European Union funds, it's also unwittingly punishing the majority of Hungarian academics and students who are in Hungarian public universities who are now excluded from pan-European mobility. So this is the paradoxical side of the EU saying as a punishment for uh, Orban's um, anti uh, uh, and illiberal uh, politics, Hungarian students are no longer allowed the Erasmus uh, mobility um, instrument, uh, which would allow them to spend time at universities in Europe abroad. So it's actually punishing the majority of Hungarian students who would benefit from being able to leave their country's public universities to spend time uh, abroad. So it denies them the uh, access to the exchange schemes of the Erasmus uh, program. So for all the structural asymmetries and imperfections of the rapidly globalizing production of knowledge, many universities, academics and students alike, could until recently entertain the promise, sometimes illusionary, of a world without borders, a world of opportunities and discoveries, in a world torn apart by increasing geopolitical division and polarization, this hope is rapidly fading for many, and the universalist utopia of liberal arts education in the true sense of the world is out of reach, either due to unaffordability or due to new border regimes which restrict mobility. The ruthless backlash against women's education in Afghanistan since the Taliban retook the country two years ago is an extreme outlier. But let me give you two examples, again from my university, which show how precarious the situation of many of our students has become in a world in which foreign governments can, from abroad, impinge on academic freedom. An Egyptian master's student of ours was tried and jailed in Egypt by a military court on the charge of criticizing his government on Facebook while in, uh, uh, at CU in Vienna. He could only graduate remotely after strenuous efforts by the university with very strong support and untiring support by the Austrian government, although this student of ours was not a dual national. We got him released from custody after 18 months, a year of which was spent in solitary confinement, and he is not allowed to leave the country, but he could graduate from, uh, from uh, Cairo. More recently, the Russian government declared the CEU to be an undesirable organization, which effectively places our Russian students before an impossible dilemma. They either need to end their studies at the CEU, or if they graduate, they not only graduate with the stigma of a CEU degree, which is unusable, of course, in Russia, but they may face possible persecution should they return home. Students, especially from the Global South, are facing difficulties obtaining visas to even enter Europe. 
So looking at the world from a Central European perspective, it seems as if multiple iron curtains are descending once again on us. So let me conclude by thinking about what could universities do in such a situation, but first ask the question, why do universities such as ours pose such a threat to authoritarian rule? I think because the knowledge they produce and the teaching that their curricula embodies aims to cultivate critical thought and aims to cultivate concerned citizens. There is an indispensable moral and ethical component to this ideal of liberal arts education, one which fosters liberal democracy, but it needs liberal democracy to flourish as well. So let me quote my predecessor, the CU president Yehuda Elkana, whose words I think are more timely than ever. He wrote in one of his last publications that students should be able to recognize, and I quote him, problems that confront humanity today. They must be aware of the limitations of our existing intellectual tools in coping with these problems. To have this knowledge is an absolute prerequisite in becoming active members of a democratic society. Thus, the task of the university is to educate concerned citizens for a democratic, liberal, egalitarian, open, civil society." Unquote. The normative implications of Yehuda's ideas are clear. The idea of the university for the 20th century for him was one where the aims of education are not reducible either to self-serving ambition, as he called it, or to the training of human capital, as some people put it. But it should be oriented towards, and I quote Yehuda, the creation of engaged, concerned citizens who are both professionally qualified for a competitive world, as well as critically predisposed in confronting the status quo. Education in this sense <clears throat> must embrace, and I quote him, the contradictions and the inconsistencies of science that it can cherish, so how to build an institution which cherishes uncertainty, contradictions, inconsistencies. That's one of the major challenge that we face as educators today. It's a curricular challenge, it's a pedagogical challenge, it's also a challenge of the values that we incorporate because what we can learn from the humanistic social sciences is to accept incompleteness, to accept contradictions as a given, and as Yehuda says, perhaps even to welcome these Students must be exposed to these ideas, contradictory, conflicting, including the fundamentally constitutive moment of self-reflexivity directed at our own views and practices, simply because the reality of our globally interconnected world is full of uncertainty and contradictions. And hence, Yehuda's endorsement of the former Harvard president, Drew Faust's statement when she said, universities are meant to be producers, not just of knowledge, but also often of inconvenient doubt. We could embrace a politics of knowledge that doesn't shy away from boldly proclaiming that everything that appears to be given could also be otherwise, as Yehuda put it. This may be our best hope to cope with and also hopefully overcome the uncertainties which loom on our horizon today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Randira, for your presentation. I would now like to invite our second presenter for panel one, Dr. Jo Moon Tan president of Parami University, to give his presentation via Zoom. Dr. Jaw, please. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, and especially college, for inviting me to speak at this symposium. I am truly, truly humbled to find this opportunity, especially with an esteemed colleague, Dr. Shalini, who um, talked about the issues of academic freedom under authoritarian civilian governments as opposed to military dictatorships of the 60s. And in that regard, in agreement with Dr. Shalini, I must say, we Myanmar people feel that this most, the misfortunes uh, in Myanmar are problems unsolved since our times of independence from the British rule in 1948. To share the efforts of how we are operating liberal education under a tightly controlled environment, originally thought of using PowerPoint slides with lots of photos. Um, 
but um, I decided against that for one primary reason, to ensure the security and safety of our students due to the situation that we are operating in. I also wish that I could join you all in person. Unfortunately, my current circumstances forbid me to do so, to be able to freely travel and come to Singapore. So you can see this topic of the title um, is one that is close to my heart professionally and personally. The title, Liberal Education in a Time of Geopolitical Risk, seems to suggest that there is something specific about liberal education in contrast to purely professional or vocational ones that geopolitical situations are sensitive to and vice versa. If my understanding of what liberal education is synonymous with what the symposium organizers have in mind, there certainly is truth in the title. Practitioners of liberal education, or more meaningfully, liberal arts and sciences education, such as institutions, faculty, and students, are highly affected by geopolitical instabilities. So let me first establish the definition of liberal education that I have in mind. For me, liberal education as a system of education is one that aims to achieve two ultimate intellectual goals among learners on their way to become engaged citizens. First, it is to develop a critical thinking mindset, as Dr. Shalini mentioned, and two, to analyze issues in an interdisciplinary or at least a multidisciplinary approach. In my experience, both outcomes feed into each other, and one is not so complete without the other. In a perfectly stable environment in which education is cherished for its own intrinsic value, liberal education's goals would seem quite innocuous. But in an oppressive environment such as the one that I am from, in Myanmar, under the Myanmar military regime, both of these seemingly innocuous goals are fatal to the, the to the way they wish to rule. Empowering students to think critically requires us educators to help them question everything. That means nurturing students to critique assumptions, challenge long-held dogmas, and at times even question authorities. Educating students for interdisciplinary analysis requires us to help students understand issues from multi-dimensional perspectives, regardless of the major that the students are interested in. That means liberal education educates, say, even business major students enrolled in a liberal arts education institution to have fundamental understanding in politics, economics, psychology, mathematics, science, and technology so that they can analyze business issues through these myriad perspectives, not just from the perspectives of business as usual. So this form of education, that means that these two educational goals is anathema to a military regime. To underscore the gravity of the situation in which we are operating our university, please allow me to take us all back to just a few years ago to share with you all the landscape of higher education before the coup in February 2021. Myanmar, also known as Burma, was on a highly promising development path during the decade of 2010 to 2020. There were a lot of educational reforms in both basic education and higher education. The civilian government formed a various parliamentarian committees to introduce a series of reforms. Those committees were responsible for various efforts on promoting academic freedom, which was one of the central topics during that decade, and a great deal of university autonomy away from centralized control under what was used to be the military control. While there were steps of reform in government university education, those committees were also involved in setting up processes for registration of private universities like Parami. In fact, I was asked by these committees to create an association of private universities in which I was elected to serve as the president to streamline efforts of all the reforms of private universities in Myanmar. Parmi itself bought 34 acres of land in northern Yangon to break the ground in March 2021, just one month, supposed to be one month after the coup, to build a private residential Lavoir's college. In fact, 
we even received the initial university license as a private nonprofit university from a relevant parliamentarian committee. As you could see, there was so much hope, so much hope within the country, within the nation. You can see hope just springing out of everybody's eyes during that decade. All those hopeful strides came to a sudden halt after the military staged the coup in 2021 to dismantle a democratically elected, young democratically elected civilian government. All peaceful pro protests were met with violent crackdowns with the scores of civilians, including women and children, killed. The unjust violent crackdowns and indiscriminate killing by the Myanmar military resulted in many young people fleeing their hometowns, thousands and thousands of them, and joining opposition armed forces. The members of higher education institutions bear the brunt the most, as the most civically engaged stakeholders are in the university sector. Many students from public universities left the public education system. Compare this, a typical University student population in the post school year 2020 was 1 million, approximately 1 million students. Now it stands at approximately 300,000 in the year 2022, as the students boycotted the military regime controlled university education. Likewise, the faculty population dropped to a third, from 28,000 to a mere 8,500 as the majority of the faculty participated in the fine civil disobedience movements. To ameliorate the dire educational situation, the National Unity Government, which stands as the democratically elected opposition government in exile, has been organizing many online education programs, mostly in the form of short courses, of course. They have been able to deliver educational programs to tens of thousands of students in coordination with many university councils that they helped to set up across the country. Now, private initiatives, uh, new as well as existing ethnic-based and community-based schools have all stepped up to fill the massive, massive gap. The Burmese military-controlled ruling machinery called the State Administrative Council now requires any in-person institution wishing to operate in Myanmar to sign a pledge saying that they will not discuss, talk about, or teach, and sometimes that they, they combine all the words and all the verbs by saying indoctrinate of foreign values, cultures, and ideas, and that any institution uh, that is operating in Myanmar in person will have to be at the mercy of the military regime's scrutiny and um, arrest and um, torment. So how are we running a liberal arts and science institution under the oppression of the Myanmar military? How do we, as a young institution, handle these vulnerabilities? And of course, we operate it with many limitations, difficulties, challenges, and threats. And here, I want to share three core strategies that we employed right now. The first is implementing agile reconfiguration. As in the case of individuals like me who have become stateless, institutions like Parami that could be easily targeted by the military regime had to relocate out of Myanmar and base themselves outside of the mainland. Many Burmese organizations, particularly in the democratic uh, uh, forces um, and spirit, have established themselves as NGOs in other countries, mostly in Thailand. As for Parvi University, the board of the university decided to establish it, establish it as a nonprofit corporation based in Washington, D.C., and got the university license under the Washington, D.C. government in June 2022 as a private nonprofit online synchronous university. Right now, we offer associate and bachelor degrees in addition to other non-formal education programs. We welcome 57 first-year undergraduate students in the class of 2026 and 89 undergraduate students in the class of 2027. Given that most of our, um, many of our students are spread across Myanmar, and given many of the university-aged students have dropped out of public universities 
as well as government high schools, Parami has, has to devise a flexible and yet highly rigorous and personalized admissions processes to evaluate student admissions. Now, the second strategy is fostering international institutional partnerships. As the saying goes, friends in need or friends indeed. Parami has been very lucky to have really good supportive friends and partnerships. Bard College, based in New York, stepped up even more in lending academic and administrative support to Parami. Bard and Parami University now work together in dual degree partnerships so that students who go to Parami now get bachelor degrees uh, from both institutions. As a member of the Open Society University Network, which was founded by Bard College and Central European University, Parami University received immense support to lay the groundwork very much needed in that transition. The, net the network provides many in-person as well as virtual programs for students to engage and gain extracurricular experiences at the also network institutions. For example, a few of our students went to Austria and Hungary to go to the EU, a member of the OSON, to participate in student engagement activities. And because of the OSON online classes, our Myanmar students now have a chance to be part of global classrooms where students from across the world get to attend. And so our students are not just studying with other Myanmar students, but also with international students. Being a, a part of such a network provide a great deal of resilience against geopolitical disruptions. And I want to take this opportunity, this golden opportunity, to invite and request folks here for, for further partnerships and collaboration with Parami. The third strategy is maintaining domestic organizational partnerships. Even though we are now based entirely outside of Myanmar, we maintain strong domestic collaborations with community-based organizations throughout the country. These mutually beneficial relationships have two results. First, these community-based organizations have been able, able, able to provide very much needed room and board arrangements, we call them learning hubs, for many of the students coming from remote areas throughout Myanmar where they have limited access to internet and electricity. Given all our students are learning online using synchronous video conferencing tools, it is important that we create these facilities to ensure equitable educational access. Second, these community-based organizations have become the places where we also have been able to create student activities, such as student conferences, gatherings, and workshops, of course, all under the protection and the guise of these community-based organizations. Creating the learning hubs and facilities as well as the student activities under the umbrella of the, these organizations creates a strong sense of community among our students thereby resulting in a high retention, freshman retention rate of nearly 90%, even amidst a great deal of insecurity and intense fighting throughout the country. So in summary, uh, Parmi University right now is a reimagined, totally reimagined university for education in crisis, under crisis. Rather than being bogged down by what we cannot do right now, we designed, redesigned the university through agile reconfiguration with strong international and domestic partnerships with no nuclear campus, which can be easily targeted by authoritarian regimes, but with a connected web of learning activities that actually matter to students, Parami University is in essence spread across the country and beyond. Of course, it is the vision, organizational vision of the university to be able to go back to the ground in the future. But right now, it is the, our institutional duty to focus on the mission. That is what we can do for the students right now, how we can educate the students right now. I hope that you see Parmi University as a working model of liberal education in a time of geopolitical risk. And I hope that the strategies that we have employed can be at least partially beneficial to other institutions facing similar tragedies of education in crisis. Thank you very much.